more to mirror practice then on trigonometry uh, from Jacqueline Tyler. So thank you again to her for writing this. I'll put her email and a link to this paper below. I think there's only like 10 questions here, but they're all good ones. Um, first one is going to say, what's the largest solution for x for this equation? We'll obviously take away 1, divide by 2, and then we'll do sine inverse of minus a half. Now, we need to think about the range carefully here, because if we double this and then take away pi over 3 from both, we'll end up with this. This is like 12 pi over 3, right? So we'll just take away a pi over 3 to get this. Now, when we think about the sine graph in the range all the way up to, this is roughly 4 pi, I guess. Um, all we need to say is, well, um, we, the, the, the largest solution we're going to find is the one that's closest to here, right? And then we can do the change and, uh, and we'll get the closest thing to 2 pi that we can. So, okay, sine equals minus a half. That's going to be down here. Um, sine equals a half is going to be at pi over 6, I believe. So if we go pi over 6 beyond pi, that will be our first solution, or pi over 6 back from 2 pi, or more importantly, pi over 6 back from 4 pi. Now, the problem is pi over 6 back from 4 pi takes you there. And if you double this to get 22 over 6, you'll see that this one is just out of range. So instead, we need to go 3 pi plus pi over 6 to find our biggest valid solution, which will be this here. And then, of course, we can just set this inside equal to it, add pi over 3 to both sides and divide by 2. And we'll end up if we then divide that by 3 with 7 pi over 4, which is what that is. Question 2, then, uh, very similar. We're going to change the range as before. Uh, so we're looking in this range here. Tan inverse of 1 is pi over 4. Um, although it's also, I guess, if you just add pi, we don't even need to draw the um, the tan graph really because all we're going to do is add pi and take away pi. Um, of course, if we add pi, we get beyond the range pi. So taking away pi is fine. That's slower than the range minus pi. So these will be the two answers. We add pi to both sides, we divide by 2. And then, of course, if we add those up, we get 6 pi over 8, which is 3 pi over 4. Good. Question number 3. So we're going to divide both sides by 2. And now that's sine inverse root 2 over 2. Now, that is, of course, in, in radians, that's pi over 4. Um, but it's also, like, you can go beyond uh, pi over 2, can't you, to 3 pi over 4. But the problem is, as soon as you go beyond pi over 4, all of your solutions are going to be larger than 1, right? 3 pi over 4 is larger than 1. And so cos x equals them isn't valid. Um, and you could try on the other side, but, of course, to get to the negatives from sine, you'd have to go to, or sorry, to get to the positives, if you're going backwards towards the negatives in sine, you have to go quite a long way away. So pi over 4 is going to be the only solution to this is valid because it's the only one I can take cos inverse of in the first place. So now I can take cos inverse once I draw the cos graph maybe. I don't even really have to because it's just asking me how many solutions it has. So just getting that this is the only one valid from here is probably the only tricky thing here because of course cos x has two solutions to pi over 4. Pi over 4 is a bit less than 1, right? So we're, we're looking for a solution up to about here. And there's of course two solutions in the range 0 to pi, 2 pi, so that, that's that done. Really lovely question here. Firstly, just write the two out that swap this sine 3x with this tan 3x, because that way we have the same thing here and here. Let's, of course, times the top equation maybe by root 2 to make this. Now we can add the two equations together. Divide by 8. Again, we just saw that sine inverse of root 2 over 2 is pi over 4, but we're actually working in degrees now, so that's 45. Or 135, that's 45 beyond 90. And then we're going all the way up to 540 because we've got a 3 axis. Let's just add 360 to that. And now 360, that, that'll be the only two other solutions we can find. Divide them all by three and we get this. Now, the problem is we can't just add all of those together because we also need to check that this works for the other one, tan 3x as well. So what we'll do is we'll substitute um, sine 3x as root 2 over 2 into here. And, of course, cancels a bunch of stuff there. And then we solve this for tan 3x equals minus 1. Now, tan x is minus 1 is at 45, obviously, but we're looking for minus 1, so we just go to 135 first or backwards but we can't really go backwards because we're greater than zero so 135 would be the first one and then you, of course you just add multiples of 180 until you get those three divide all by three and you get this and now we just need to look for which solutions coincide because of course this is a simultaneous equation we need x and y to to both carry this and both be okay so x is 45 aligns for both and x is 165 aligns for both so those would be our only two valid solutions since they are the only ones that work for both of the functions, and uh, we'll add them together to get 210. Question number five, then, we've got uh, sine x is this. Quite a nice question here that you can kind of trick. Uh, obviously, the, this is a graph that's been translated a little bit, but if I just think about when the regular sine graph is greater than a half, uh, sine of x equals a half at pi over 6, as we said already in this video, and then also at 5 pi over 6, you just do pi minus pi over 6. Now, that's a total range of 4 pi over 6, right? So if you then do 4 pi over 6 over 2 pi, 
you can argue that the regular sine graph is above the value of a half for this much time in the whole kind of in one cycle between zero and two pi. And then you need to argue that, well, okay, no matter how much you translate the sine graph left and right, even if you translate it far enough to bring this point here back past the zero point, all that's going to happen is you're going to gain that same amount from the other end when the other cycle starts coming back past the two pi point. So however much, as long as you don't squish the graph or stretch the graph, no matter how much you translate this graph left and right, the proportion of the time that's above the value of half is going to remain the same. So the answer is just going to be one third, and uh, we can just leave it there. Find the greatest value of this function then. So yeah, a couple of ways you could do this. I decided to, um, to first say that sine squared is, of course, between zero and one, because sine is between zero and one. You just square it. Sorry, it's between minus one and one. So when you square it, it's between zero and one. So what I can say here is that if I times that by three, I'll, of course, get it to between zero and three. And then all I really want is to square the biggest absolute number I can. So, I mean, I don't really care whether this inside is negative. I just want to square the largest thing or the furthest thing from zero that I can, because of course it will square to a positive anyway. So I could put in zero and I'll get zero minus seven all squared, which is minus seven squared, which is 49. Or I could put in three, but three minus seven gives me a small absolute number. So I think the 49 is going to be the highest thing I'm able to get here. And, uh, and I'll just leave my answer there. Uh, good tricks here, uh, as you often see with these questions. 4 is 2 squared, and then because these two things would multiply, of course, with brackets, you can just swap them over because multiplying doesn't matter the order. You can make a substitution now, maybe um, u equals 2 to the sine x, and you end up with this quadratic. And, of course, finding the max value of this quadratic shouldn't be too bad, although we will have some restrictions based on the 2 to the sine x. We need to be a bit careful. I decided to complete the square here. I'm not sure why. I could have just differentiated it, and it might have been much easier. But completing the square is always good practice, right? Factorize out the three, halve that, 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 that number here, take away the square of it, combine these two things together. And now, yeah, we need to think carefully about this because it, it's similar to what we just saw. We want this thing here to be as big as possible so that we can add another positive thing and make the whole thing as big as possible. Um, so how do we make this bracket here as big as possible? Well, we don't necessarily need to use the biggest two to the sine x we can, right? Sine x is as big as one, two to the one is two. And then two take away five thirds is I think one third. And that's quite a small number. I can actually do much better if I go the other end and I use sine x as minus one, because then we end up with two to the minus one, which is only a half. And that's the biggest distance I can get between this number and this number. And of course, if I can make the biggest distance I can between the two, when it squares, it will be the biggest thing it can be because squares always square to positives anyway. So let's use sine of x as a half, is minus one to turn two to the minus one equal to a half. Find that difference, square it, Eventually, you'll times by three and add on two thirds. And uh, after a bit of maths, you'll end up with uh, this number here, which divides by three, I think, to get 19 over four. Good. Question number eight, then. Which of these is the largest? So tan pi over four is one. And uh, if you add pi to a tan value, you get the same value. So this must just be one. Pi over four plus pi is pi over pi over four. Um, now, sine of three pi over four is some number less than one. So when I square that, it's going to also be less than one. So we can kind of immediately, I mean, you could actually do the value if you wanted to, but we instantly knew it was less than one because it's not the singular case where you get one. So it's definitely less than one. Now this value here, let's just estimate pi to be three because we're engineers. Five times three is 15. Over four is, it's nowhere near 10, right? Even if pi is a bit bigger than three, that's nowhere near 10. So log to base 10 of this number is less than one because it's less than log to base 10 of 10, which is one. And here, again, estimating pi as three, three times three is nine. Now nine over four is bigger than two. So this is bigger than log to base two of two, which is one. So this is bigger than one. And because the only other things are less than one or one, this just means that D is, is clearly the biggest. Question nine is a really nice question. I think I went kind of the wrong direction with this. I decided to sort of vaguely draw the two triangles that map and make this. So it's it's that non-congruent case. Somewhere in the vast catalogue of videos that are on this channel, I've made a triangle continuity video that involves a game show. Um, that yeah, I mean, it's a brilliant video, I'm not gonna lie. Um, I, I, I also can't lie, I completely forgot when I was doing this video, everything that was contained within that video. So I kind of just had to do this in probably a non-intelligent way. 
Um, but these are the two triangles they're trying to get at. You have a specified theta that's the same, obviously. And then you have these two values. Basically, you can think of this as having either the five like this or the five like this. And think about like a, making a circle from C with radius five. There are two places you can touch this line, right? Going up here and touching it here or going out there and touching it there. And that just makes your two triangle cases. Now, this triangle apparently has an area twice as large as the other one. But of course, the area of these two triangles is just given by, if this length here was x, just half times x times 11 times sine theta. So if this triangle is twice the area of this triangle, this just must be 2x. Like That just must be a thing, because then the areas are twice as big. So okay, now we can maybe do some cosine rule on both of them, right? This is cosine rule on the first one, and then we can simplify that, and then we can do cosine rule on the second one, and we can simplify it. So that's pretty boring. But now I think I can probably just solve this for cos theta, because it's just a single Hayes equation, right, in x and, th in x and theta. So. so okay, I'm not sure how I did this. I can't remember. I think I doubled this one and just set it equal to this one which is actually going to solve me for x, which is a bit irritating because I don't really want to do that. I want theta, but it doesn't matter. I can put the x back in here and uh, we end up with this. We've got a bit more work to do here. Turns into this. Looking at the answers here, I was a bit annoyed because I couldn't see anything with a root 3 in it, where it's clear cos theta is going to make a root 3 until you notice this one actually does have a root 3 in it, right? It's, it's root 12. So this must be the answer. I guess this is technically a root 3, but it's also we've got a root 2, which we don't have. So it must be b, but that's just actually double check that it is b um root 12 is is 2 root 3 so that's 6 root 3 over 11 and then of course we can we can rationalize this over here um don't bother actually doing any multiplying um 1 plus 4 over 3 is 48 and then you can see if you divide both of those by by 8 you're going to end up with this here and so b i think is our correct answer and the last question on this paper i think is a nice question here we've got um, a triangle again something that looks a bit like this i guess no such triangle can be drawn if, if BC is 7. So let's just test that. Let's call BC 7. And then if we call this angle down here theta, we could just try solving for theta because we've got enough information here for sine rule to work. So let's set, up, set that up and we end up with this, which turns into this. And now the problem here is root 3 is bigger than 1.5. I just know that. 5 times 1.5 is 7.5 over 7 is bigger than 1. So this doesn't have any solutions because we can't arc sine that. So that goes away. So, so one is a true statement, right? It just causes an angle that we can't be dealing with. So that's a true statement. Number two, let's put in five root three and do the same thing. And, uh, and of course, it, everything ends up being pretty much the same. We get sine theta equals one, which has infinite number of solutions. But again, if this is a triangle, we're only looking for solutions from zero to 180 and actually zero to 120 because this angle is already taking up 60 of the degrees available. And of course, there's only one solution to sine theta equals one in, in the range zero to 120. So that's uh, exactly one distinct triangle can be drawn is a true statement as well. It's just the one that has 90 here. And now it says exactly two distinct triangles can be drawn if that's 12. Again, do the same thing. We get the same kind of maths. We get this. Now that, as we were talking about before, this is roughly 7.5 or just a bit bigger than 7.5. So this is a number less than one. So sure, initially you think, well, sine theta has two solutions to anything between um, 0 and 1 uh, from 0 to 180, right, or 0 to pi. We're going to get two solutions, this one here and this one here. Except again, because this angle here is taking up 60 of your degrees that you have available, you're actually only looking up to the value 120 degrees to find your second solution. So in other words, if the first solution is bigger than 60, so if the, the first, the principal solution is bigger than 60, that means the other solution, sorry, is less than 60, I should say, if the first solution is less than 60, that means the other solution is bigger than 120, and you can't put an angle bigger than 120 in this. And so that would be wrong. So how do we know whether this gives a principal solution less than 60? Well, what we do is we say, well, this thing here is clearly less than root 3 over 2. Because this is root 3 over 2 would be 6 twelfths. So this is less than root 3 over 2. But sine theta is root 3 over 2 gives you a solution of 60. So the fact that we're looking for something slightly less than root 3 over 2 means that our first solution is less than 60, which means our second solution, 180 minus that, is bigger than 120, which we can't jam into this triangle because of the 60 degrees. And so this one is actually false, and we'll end up with 1 and 2 only. And uh, that's the whole paper. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.